Greetings, Dr. Wolfula here with a special presentation. What you are about to watch is a re-upload of the first video uploaded to the Gulag channel, a spin-off channel handled by my zombified underling, Goulash. The video in question is a big review by Goulash and I from 2021 of Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. The classic animated film that kickstarted Scooby's non-stop run of direct-to-video movies. I'm re-uploading this to my channel to promote the return of the Gulag channel after its long hiatus with a riff view of Adam's Family Reunion. And if you like this vid, be sure to subscribe to the Gulag channel today because there are new vids on the way. Link in the description. Anyway, here's the Gulag review of Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. Enjoy! here and welcome to the Gulag. As you can see, I'm a zombie and I've been forced through threat of violence by my creator, Dr. Wolfula, to make YouTube videos. And being a zombie, for this channel's first video, I'm covering Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. The first direct-to-video Scooby-Doo film and the franchise's first foray into actual horror. This film still scares the shit out of me. Yeah, I'm sure it does. That's my creator, Dr. Wolfula. He's gonna be chiming in during this video. Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfula. You're not the host, sir. You're the guest this time. Oh my god, you're right. This isn't fair. Life isn't fair. Now before we get to the review, let's talk a bit about how Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island came to existence. Now of course, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island wasn't Scooby's first film ever. The series maintained popularity through the 70s and 80s and had its fair share of made-for-TV movies like Ghoul School or Reluctant Werewolf, but these films were made within the constraints of network standards and practices of the time. The original TV series, Scooby-Doo Where Are You, was even meant to be a lot scarier than it ended up being, but again, Again, in the 60s, there were hard limits of what you could get away with on network TV, especially for kids' shows. Scooby-Doo was reaching its 30th anniversary in the 90s, and it only got more popular through Cartoon Network reruns, but the series remained mostly dormant for a decade after pup name Scooby-Doo ended in 1991. During this time period, Turner Broadcasting had purchased Hanna-Barbera and was focusing the cartoon studio on making new animated shows like Dexter's Laboratory, instead of rehashing all their old characters. It ended up being a boon for creativity while the classic shows were allowed to flourish in reruns on Cartoon Network. It was a great time when animators were allowed to actually come up with new ideas. An insane notion in today's nightmare reality, but things changed. Turner was acquired by Time Warner in 1996, so Hanna-Barbera and Cartoon Network fell under Warner's ownership as well. And, as Disney taught us with Marvel and Star Wars, when you're a huge media company that just spent a ton of money buying another media company, you're gonna want a return of investment fast by taking advantage advantage of the most valuable IP, and Scooby-Doo in the intervening years managed to become Hanna-Barbera's crown jewel, eclipsing Flintstones, Johnny Quest, and everything else in popularity. So it goes without saying that Hanna-Barbera was tasked with reviving the meddling kids for a 90s audience. Then why'd you say it? But Scooby-Doo wasn't brought back right away with a show. Turner had previously spent millions on a Johnny Quest reboot titled The Real Adventures of Johnny Quest, but it failed to reach a large enough audience despite all the marketing, the merchandise, and the fact that the show was aired on multiple f***ing networks. The CGI was pretty cool back then at least. Yeah, it's really aged well. Johnny Quest, do you really understand the entity you've unleashed upon your world? Warner decided to go in a different, less expensive, and more experimental direction with the Scooby-Doo reboot. Instead of a show, they would make the first ever direct-to-video Scooby-Doo film. Disney was finding great success during this time with their own swath of direct-to-video animated films begun with Return of Jafar. So of course, Warner, with all their newfound animation might, wanted to get in on the action. Scooby-Doo was the perfect choice of property to begin this endeavor, but it wouldn't be the Scooby-Doo of the 60s. This Scooby-Doo film would be darker, more violent, and there would be nudity, sexual content, and more open drug use. Sir, that stuff isn't in this movie. Did we see the same movie? I guess not. What the film did have that was advertised heavily before release was real monsters instead of the men in costumes we'd grown accustomed to. Get ready for Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, because this time the monsters are real. But the marketing made it seem like the Scooby franchise never had real monsters, but in reality, 
the last made-for-TV movies all had real monsters. They already made a Scooby show with real ghosts. The real difference with Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island was that, despite being more dark, the film would be returned to the franchise's roots with the original members of the Scooby gang revamped, and that also meant that Zombie Island would be the first major Scooby-Doo project to drop Scooby's nephew, Scrappy-Doo, since the character was first introduced. Of course, pup named Scooby-Doo didn't have Scrappy either, but that was a prequel. He wasn't born yet. Scrappy-Doo's absence went completely unnoticed, of course. The film was going to be darker, and having a little dog say puppy power isn't going to really help sell the scariness. Of course, Scrappy's dismissal became permanent going forward. Even when the tone of the franchise became lighter, Scrappy's few other appearances would be of a derisive nature. Ghosts don't stand a chance with me! Let me at him! Rock him! Fans are split about Scrappy-Doo today, but while the character admittedly helped the franchise's ratings for a time, Scrappy also interfered with the existing dynamic of the Scooby Gang, leading to an exile of Fred and Velma and eventually even Daphne. Scrappy was an attempt to fix the show with a cute, gimmicky character that says catchphrases, instead of just returning the quality of the series to the standards of Scooby-Doo, where are you? Even if we can't all agree Scrappy sucked, we can at least agree Flim Flam was terrible. I fucking hate that little punk ass kid. I know, sir. Everybody knows. Scrappy listeners aside, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is widely hailed as a high point of the series, so allow me to explain why with my review of Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. Zombie Island sets itself apart right off the bat with a slow, eerie opening that builds up a sense of atmospheric tension. You know, like what a horror movie would have to build a mood. Eventually, the gang is introduced in their familiar, colorful forms, but despite this, and even when the classic theme song covered by Third Eye Blind plays, the opening is paced more like a horror film with the characters actually almost dying a few times. <laughs> The moat monster in the opening alone is far more threatening than anything seen up to this point in the Scooby franchise. How did Daphne and Velma destroy that stone railing just by running into it? Instead of scaring or catching them, this monster is just trying to straight up kill these teenagers. Dude looks like he could effortlessly split Fred in two. Eventually, the monster is revealed to be a fraud, though. A man named Mr. Beeman, who was running a counterfeiting operation in the basement of a spooky medieval-looking castle in America. And I would have gotten away with it, too, if it wasn't for that big dog and you meddling kids! Despite the clearly extreme dangers of this mystery alone, it was the catalyst for Mr. Mystery ain't going their separate ways because the mysteries got boring, always being revealed to just be dudes in masks. The monsters and ghosts always turned out to be bad guys in a mask. Got a little boring, eh? <laughs> no kidding. Apparently almost getting murdered on a regular basis isn't exciting enough. In fact, that's why the gang went their separate ways. Daphne has now become a TV reporter with a successful syndicated travel show called Coast to Coast, and Fred, well, he's the himbo cameraman that everyone undresses with their eyes. How about getting a shot? Out of Freddy, guys! Vilma is stuck living a friendless life running an unsuccessful bookstore at the start of the Amazon age, but hey, she runs a business though, huh? Oh, solving mysteries was a lot more fun than selling them. Shaggy and Scooby, meanwhile, surprisingly have actual jobs. In their case, as airport customs officers, but instead of Scooby sniffing out a kilo of Colombian Bam Bam, they find contraband food, and seeing as they're now airport employees, Shaggy and Scoob naturally make all this confiscated cuisine disappear appear, but their boss is angry with them for some reason. Yeah, I thought airports were supposed to lose your sh there's still a couple of Gorgonzolas left. You're a couple of Gorgonzolas! You're fired! Daphne is planning to do a series on haunted places across the USA and actually misses her less charismatic cohorts for some reason. It's too bad the rest of the old gang won't be along for the ride. Yeah, I really miss them. Which gives Fred the idea to bring Shaggy, Scooby, and even Velma along for the ride. Surprise! Something worth noting is that there have been some revamps of the designs. The Mystery Machine is an actual modern van that just happens to be painted like a relic from the 60s. Shaggy, Velma, and Scooby look largely the same, having pretty timeless designs to begin with, but the more dated Fred and Daphne have the most changes, both losing their ascots and trading them in for a blazer on Daph and a f***ing vest on Fred. The Fred and Daphne designs make sense given the attempt to modernize the series, but the choice in fashion for this film honestly just makes them seem like even more boring characters. There's at least a brief reference to Fred's ascot, which shows that he still always carries it with him at least. Nah. 
The last appearance of the Scooby Gang all together as adults before Zombie Island was in 1984, so the reunion that happens in the film carries some actual meaning, but a lot changes in more than a decade. The biggest change to the cast in Zombie Island are the voices, though. Frank Welker returns as Fred, of course. He's played Fred in nearly everything except pup named Scooby Doo and some games, but Welker almost didn't return until he had to prove that his voice hadn't changed in 30 years. Me? No, I, I don't think so. B.J. Ward returned as Velma after appearing in a Johnny Bravo episode as the character. Speaking of old times, look what I have for you, Scooby. The late Mary Kay Bergman played Daphne. But this time, I intend to find some real haunted houses for my viewers. And hardcore Scooby-Doo fan and newcomer to the franchise, Scott Innes, played Scooby himself after Don Messick, the original voice, passed away. The film is even dedicated to Messick's memory. The most noticeable difference in Zombie Island's cast is Billy West playing Shaggy, I believe for the only time, making this film the first Scooby project without Casey Kasem's involvement. Kasem quit voicing Shaggy because he was a vegan and was asked to voice Shaggy in a Burger King commercial, much to his chagrin. Kasem demanded that if he were to return as Shaggy, the character would have to be a vegetarian, which is something the creators of Zombie Island weren't willing to negotiate on. So Kasem was replaced by Billy West, who provides a decent voice, but it's honestly one of the weakest vocal portrayals of Shaggy in animation. Like too long, Velma. They're stale. And West was eventually replaced as Shaggy by Scott Innes. Yeah, the makers of this film had to have known early on Billy West's voice was not gonna work for the long term. Something will turn up. So what if this was like the greatest gig ever? <laughs> anyway, the gang is back together to help out with Daphne's TV show as unpaid interns, and the hauntings they seek all turn out to be their usual fare. And if that's not clear, hopefully the catchy as hell Sky Cycle song explaining that the monsters are all fake makes the message loud and clear. The ghost is here. The musical montage is a pretty impressive bit of animation because it quickly and efficiently tells four separate and distinct Scooby-Doo mysteries in the space of a minute, while looking as flashy as possible and perfectly in sync with the animation. <laughs> Daphne isn't satisfied with the footage, though. She wants a real live ghost on camera for a show, but honestly, in her experience, she should just assume there are no real ghosts. I need a real live ghost. That's an oxymoron, Daph. Doesn't anybody want a beignet? Fortunately, this Esmeralda-looking chick named Lena coincidentally approaches the gang, claiming to be a chef that works at a haunted house, and she's very quick to potentially lose her job imposing a TV crew unannounced on her employer's property. I work as a chef in a house on Moon Sky Island, a house that really is haunted. Jinkies. The house resides on Moonscar Island, a secluded creepy place within a bayou that certainly wouldn't be home to any zombies like me. Well, no offense, Lena, but it's probably just some guy in an old pirate suit trying to scare off the local kids. Moonscar Island is also the location of an old southern, uh, plantation. It's a pepper plantation. Along the way to the mansion, the gang meets non-stop suspects in the haunting before they even get to know what the haunting is. There's the friendly Wilford Brimley looking ferry driver named Jacques, voiced by Jim Cummings, doing his Tigger voice, but with a French accent. Pirates use this bayou to hide from the law. There's the ultra-suspicious looking fisherman named Snakebite Scruggs, who's pursuing a legendarily large catfish named Big Mona. Shoulda let the gators eat ya. I can't stand tourists. Snakebite is actually voiced by Mark Hamill in a pretty thankless minor role early in his voice acting career. Hamill also played the airport manager character seen briefly, so I guess at this point he was just trying to put himself out there as an available voice actor for hire, taking what he can get between Joker appearances. Hamill actually made an appearance in a Scooby-Doo series before he became famous in Star Wars, playing his character Corey from the Genie cartoon on an episode of new Scooby-Doo movies. Yeah, four guys ought to be able to do the job. And Hamill would later frequently appear in future Scooby shows, including most recently playing his famed role, the Joker, and even himself for the second time ever. That's nice trivia and all, sir, but did you really need to talk about Mark Hamill for a minute of my video? This is important fucking information, goulash. Maybe you should take some notes and learn a thing or two about what people really want to hear about. Okay, I guess you're the expert on this kind of stuff. You're damn right I am. I'm comfortable with my fame. Sure, it's only a small part of who I am, but that's showbiz.
All right, well, the other suspects include an extremely pissy gardener named Bo and his employer, the owner of the estate, Madame Simone Lenoir, played by B-movie icon Adrian Barbeau. And despite the fact that Scooby destroys her property and terrorizes her cats, the woman still opens her home to a TV crew with supposedly no knowledge of it beforehand. You're welcome to look around, if you'd like. Would we ever? Not suspicious at all. While Shag and Scoob, of course, raid this stranger's kitchen of all their fine-made Cajun cuisine like the dirty, mooching hippies they are, they become frightened by the house's paranormal activity. Ghost riding! See? This place is haunted! Oh, Jordan Peele totally ripped this movie off. You're joking, of course, but if you actually think about it, the plot of the Scooby-Doo live-action movie involving a conspiracy at a theme park where the souls of visitors are replaced and their bodies are taken over with evil intent was basically the plot of Get Out. Yeah, yeah, and if you really think about it, Us was just a rip-off of Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase. Uh, yeah, sure it was. Think about it! I totally will, anyway, after Daphne gets her rocks off watching a ghost-assisted Velma upskirt shot. This just gets better and better, maybe from where you're standing. The gang discovers that the island is supposedly haunted by an honest-to-goodness pirate ghost named Morgan Moonscar, the house itself built from the remains of his pirate ship, the Maelstrom. And this ghost really wants the meddling kids to get the f*** off this island. And he does a pretty good job of it when he appears in zombie form. Holy shit! <laughs> Yes, this film is certainly, most likely, the scariest that Scooby-Doo has ever dared to be. This movie had a PG rating and definitely made the most of it. The subsequent direct-to-video films have ended up toning down the scariness of this movie, unfortunately. When I was still alive, though, I remember watching this film when I was a five-year-old, and I could still handle it. It's unfortunate that Warner Brothers didn't continue going down the dark route of Zombie Island. It might be more intense and spooky, but it's not like Morgan Moonscar impales a guy with his cutlass or anything. Yeah, it's pretty much still a classic Scooby mystery, just where the monsters are real and actually scary. I mean, come on, kids aren't p***ies, they can handle a movie like this. This film was made as an experiment to see if it could be successful and test the limits of what could be acceptable in a direct-to-video Scooby-Doo film. So the makers of Zombie Island, director Jim Stenstrom, and screenwriters Glenn Leopold and Davis Doy were given total creative freedom with the film. They had years of experience with Scooby-Doo, so there was trust that they wouldn't totally betray what the Scooby-Doo franchise should still be. Creative freedom with valuable long-running franchises like Scooby-Doo is virtually unheard of today because these big corporations see cartoon characters as investments that need to maintain their value, playing things as safely as possible to ensure profitability, knowing full well that the masses who simply consume media will unquestionably enjoy said media as long as it's familiar enough and reminds them of better times when they were still young. Who hurt you, sir? The Walt Disney Corporation. Several times. <laughs> I see. Well, Zombie Island's more frightening approach also makes it feel as if it is an actual full-blown horror film. Scooby-Doo debuted in 1969, and within a little more than a decade, it itself seemed to have an influence over the horror genre, particularly slasher films, and especially the Friday the 13th series. You look at Friday the 13th Part 3 and tell me the writers weren't just making a Scooby-Doo movie where people actually got stabbed. Scooby-Doo has the perfect, flexible formula for a horror movie. A man in a mask in a creepy location terrorizes teens. It's fitting, then, that things would circle around and there'd be a Scooby-Doo film that goes down the road of actual horror instead of pretend horror. It feels like the Scooby-Doo franchise was building up this whole time to Zombie Island, and the payoff feels satisfying and earned. Zombie Island still has all the cartoony gags and familiar calling cards of the franchise, but it mixes in an actual sense of menace that builds up throughout, from a ghost confederate soldier haunting a mirror that eventually builds up to the revelation that Moonscar Island is inhabited by a legion of the undead that spans generations. So wait, you're telling me that this is some kind of... Zombie Island? Yes, exactly, sir. Wait, did we watch the same movie? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, well, the film maintains its colorful, clean characters, but the world of Moonscar Island at night is rendered as a believably lived-in world of dark, foreboding terrors. It's the best of both worlds for family-friendly horror, where kids can still feel safe. You know that nothing bad can actually happen to Shaggy and Scooby, even if they're pursued by actual scary sh**. 
And the zombies of Zombie Island are genuinely terrifying. The kinds of zombies you'd find in a George Romero movie. The film even makes sure you know that it's not fooling around with the monsters by revealing that they're real in the most clever and visceral way possible. By having Fred violently attempt to rip off a zombie's mask and instead tear the whole f***ing head off. Let's all hope Fred never tries to unmask a person not wearing a mask because evidently he possesses the strength to just rip a man's head clean off. If you've ever wanted to see Fred from Scooby-Doo decapitate something though, this movie's got you covered. You fucking weirdo. Zombie Island focuses primarily on horror, even preempting Blair Witch Project by a year with some animated found footage. The standout song that plays over this film's rendition, the signature chase sequence, is It's Terror Time Again, a catchy and far more intense song than the bubblegum pop music that accompanied the classic show's chases. Cause it's terror. Zombie Island is Scooby-Doo embracing the horror aspect of the franchise and seeing it to its full potential while still having comedy and being family friendly, but admittedly, a minor flaw with Zombie Island is that it doesn't quite have a solid mystery going for it. The gang never really solves the mystery of the island's undead themselves. It's explained for them eventually during the climax of the film, a lot like how a horror movie would handle a backstory. It's not really a big deal that the mystery of this film is basic, but this is one area where the next few Scooby movies were improvements. They had better mysteries and twists to them, but the horror was toned down. Can't. Jenkins, sorry. So what is the twist of Zombie Island? It can't be that there are just zombies on the island, because otherwise the Scooby gang is going to need to grab some shotguns and start blowing zombie heads off, which would hit really close to home for me. Well, it's revealed that Lena's set the gang up the whole time, taking advantage of Fred's uncontrollable lust for her cooking. Ah. Mm. The mastermind behind the whole scheme was, of course, Madame Lenoir, who, after revealing that voodoo is real, also reveals that she isn't just a cougar, but that she's also, like, a literal cat person. This is what it looks like when a Karen is about to ask for the manager. Also Lena and Jock are cat people. It's like Wilfred Brimley f Chewbacca. Then I'll bet you're the one who found Morgan Moonscar's treasure. Morgan Moonscar. You see, 200 years ago, Simone and Lena were humble settlers who also worshipped the cat god. Weird. But their party got crashed by Morgan Moonscar and his pirates, who proceed to cast the settlers out into gator-infested waters, with Simone and Lena the only survivors. Honestly, those settlers deserve to die just for having such a dumb religion. Simone and Lena pray for the cat god's power and wreak their vengeance upon the pirates, but the power came with a curse that makes the duo immortal furries forced to sacrifice people to the cat god every harvest moon, and even though they have very little time left for the sacrifices, they're still going out of their way to James Bond villain monologue their plot and do long-winded Sailor Moon transformations into uglier cat creatures that look like Willem Dafoe. If you're wondering why the villains are cat monsters, well, this film's plot is actually borrowed from an unfinished episode of SWAT Cats titled The Curse of Cataluna. I wasn't really wondering, but thanks, I guess. Of course, though, Shaggy and Scooby bumble their way into saving the day. The gang turns turns the cat monsters voodoo dolls against them, and they kill enough time to eventually kill some cat monsters too. Looks like your nine lives are up. Who die likely the most agonizing death you can possibly have. Savage as f Thanks to the gang, the zombies are finally released from their bodies in kind of the grossest way possible, and Scooby gets saluted by the ghost of a Confederate soldier. Sort of have mixed feelings about that. Thank you. Oh yeah, it turns out that Bo the Gardener was an undercover FBI agent, which doesn't really feel important, but for some reason he's suddenly no longer an ass and he reveals that he wants to be a detective story writer, which instantly causes Velma to jinkies in her pants. I've always been crazy about a good detective. A story, that is. Allowing the film to make it clear at the last second that Velma isn't gay, she's totally straight. There's absolutely no possibility of Velma being gay. I'm glad we've put that to rest. Yeah, I'm sure we'll see a lot more of Bo in the future. Also, in a post credit scene, Scooby-Doo makes peace with the cats whose owner he kind of watched die. A happy ending. Scooby-Dooby-Doo! 
Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is the Scooby-Doo franchise at its finest, with only minor flaws. The animation is great for a direct-to-video film, and it pushed the boundaries of not only the Scooby-Doo series, but also kids' animation in general as a horror film aimed towards children. I give Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island five cat gods out of five. Well, that was this channel's first video. How'd I do, sir? Let's just say you've still got a long way to go. Ugh, so what's my next video gonna be? Take a closer look at the Zombie Island DVD. It's a double feature. What the? Return to Zombie Island? It's a 2019 sequel? Bingo! Good luck with your review of it. Oh no, this is gonna be bad, isn't it? Well, that was our review of Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. If you enjoyed the video, again, make sure to subscribe to the Gulag channel today, because there are more vids there. Like the follow-up riff view of Scooby-Doo Return to Zombie Island, and a brand new riff view of Adam's Family Reunion. Subscribe to the Gulag. If not for Goulash, do it for me, your old pal, Doc. Jinkies! Sorry. This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash Dr. Wolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash Dr. Wolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.